Well, thanks everybody. I uh, appreciate uh, you coming here tonight. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the workshoppers for uh, staying awake this long. We appreciate your efforts. I see you yawning. <laughs> Les, Les worked us all pretty hard here. Um, let's see, uh, just, just to get things rolling, um, how, many, how many people in the audience uh, were not workshop participants? Is all fresh and new. Okay, great. Welcome. Um, one of the one of the questions that I think has arisen in everybody's mind is: This seems to be a very serious uh, endeavor. We are talking about very important and very uh, exciting concepts in physics and in engineering and we're talking about things that need uh, uh, formulas and hard math and all of this kind of stuff to deal with. Why are there science fiction writers here? Why is this important for the science fiction writers to be here? Um, I think we've seen uh, some answer to that. Um, in the presentations and in Paul's presentation already. And that is because a lot of scientists and engineers and people who were involved in the aerospace industry became excited about these topics from reading science fiction. Uh, all right, so people in the workshop um, and scientists and engineers who are here um, not in the workshop, how many, how many of you uh, read science fiction when you were young? Oh yeah, okay. So, so I think that answers part of the question, why? Um, there is a, a beautiful and lovely feedback loop in the science fiction and science community. The science fiction inspires the scientists, but the scientists inspire the science fiction writers. Um, and it, uh, it's a collaborative process, and that's one of the things that I love about science fiction. Um, and about how science is done is that it is a collaborative process. It's an exciting exchange. It's, it's that fire, catching fire that Paul was talking about. Um, this is how it's done. So you get science fiction to inspire scientists who inspire science fiction writers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why this is important is part of what I hope our science fiction writers on this panel will talk about. Why is it important that we talk about getting off the planet, that we talk about establishing a, a, a solar system space industry, and why particularly is it important that we go interstellar? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that uh, challenge, that question to, to the panelists, um, but first let's find out who the panelists are. So starting on my left, Dan Hoyt, if you will tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, here's Mike. Uh, my name is Dan Hoyt. Uh, I am a, primarily a computer scientist. Uh, I also do write science fiction. Talk into the mic. Is it working? I, I am. Yes. It might not be. Talk, put it up close to your lips, like her. <laughs> I think that needs to be on. Is it not on? Push and hold the red button. Ah. See? No. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My name is Dan Hoyt. Um, I am primarily a computer scientist. I have a background in mathematics and uh, in uh, computer simulation of uh, rocket trajectories. And I write science fiction as well, um, mostly short form at this point, although I do have some other things coming out at some point. All right. Sarah? I'm Sarah Hoyt. and. Uh, I have absolutely no background in science, except for having stolen my brother's physics book. And uh, I thought the problems were lots of fun, and I couldn't understand. Since I did them in the train, I couldn't understand why I didn't have a boyfriend. <laughs> uh, 
Crazy. So, yeah, I know, strange. So, uh, but I grew up to take languages and literature. However, I grew up reading Heinlein and other science fiction writers. And I write science fiction. This is, as Les would put it, highly speculative. <laughs> but uh, there is a... Uh, uh, there, okay. There, I'm interested in doing something closer term and, and more realistic. Yeah, hi. Some of you heard me earlier. I'm Les Johnson. I'm the uh, chair of the TVIW, but as a science fiction writer, I, I feel like I'm paying back. I, I grew up reading science fiction. I have been a science fiction fan since I was old enough to utter the word science fiction. <laughs> uh, worked in the science fiction section of a bookstore in high school, which was a dangerous thing to do. Uh, not a good way to earn a lot of money and keep it when you're also managing the books that are in the store. But I started writing science fiction a few years ago after I was writing popular science books, and I, I go to a lot of science fiction conventions talking to science fiction writers. And what, what I try to write about is a realistic things that, that might actually happen in space. So a near-term space adventure, like a, a, a near-term mission to Mars, all the way out through um, interstellar travel in, in stories that I edited a collection of that are by various writers who, uh, by mandate, were exploring how we might go to the stars using known laws of physics. No warp drives, no instantaneous stargates to get us from one place to the next. You know, how might it really be done? And so my mission, as it were, is to entertain and hopefully educate a little bit as we go, because I'd like to see that next kid get hooked. And uh, I work for NASA, and believe me, we need that next generation of scientists and engineers. Uh, Tony? Is this, this one work? Yes. Uh, Tony Daniel, and uh, I have no scientist background, but uh, I was reading uh, Asimov's and Analog Science Fiction magazines in my uh, graduate English classes and to piss off the, uh, the instructors. And that's when I probably knew I was going to be a writer rather than an academic. <laughs> uh, right. been doing that. So I'm also editor of Bain Books, but she's my boss. That's true. That's true. So if you don't like what he says, you have to blame me. So. Uh, Paul, you want to talk about yeah, One other thing I, I mentioned. I'm a writer in Boston, not a scientist. Uh, by way of background, my grad work was all in medieval languages. I mean, I, I was in a totally different world professionally. And yet, this notion of starflight stayed with me all through my life. So returning to it later uh, made great sense. And I think one thing I found with the interstellar community, a lot of people uh, at various walks of life do have an abiding interest in our future in space, and in particular in this great challenge. So I, I think I'm not unique in that regard. Well, I, I think that's what we're, we're here to, to, to answer. I, I think why in particular science fiction? Why isn't it just uh, thrillers or mainstream writers or mystery writers who are writing about uh, humanity going into space. What, why is it important that science fiction people be doing this? Well, partly it's because we're the only ones who care. But, <laughs> um, but, but partly it's because of what our genre can do in, in that direction. Um, and in terms of setting goals, uh, in, in figuring out, we know how. We've, we've seen that we know how. Paul's presentation was all about this is how you can do it. This is, this is what science that we know now we can do. We know it's possible. We know how to do it. The question is why do we want to do it? What is the, why, why is the, do we need to do this? Why, why do people leave? Why do, why do we want to have this happen? Why, uh, there's a challenge laid out to me by uh, uh, a, a lady that I met this weekend. Why is it important for these resources to be spent doing this and not something else? Um, so I'd, I'd like the, the, the members of the panel to talk about how they're, what, what inspiration they got from this conference and how they're going to uh, turn that into the dreams for the next generation of engineers and scientists and writers uh, to have. I'll, I'll start with Tony. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Paul. Um, well, I got a zillion ideas from the conference. It was just like a, a, a candy store for me because I don't have to prove any of these concepts or, <laughs> or engineer them. All I have to do is rip them off and put them in stories. So, 
Um, why do it? Uh, I to entertain mostly, um, and in the process of entertaining, maybe inspire. But I'm interested in telling a good story. If I inspire people, then that's great. Uh, but I want them to to be able to uh, spend the the. 10 hours it takes to read a book or two if you're fast or whatever, um, it, enjoying it and having a good time and, and using a plausible, uh, putting somebody in a plausible future um, really lets, uh, it, make, it makes you feel like you're there. You know, in a fantasy story, it's fun, but you know it can never happen. In a science fiction story, it's plausible. It may not be scientifically accurate because some of us are English majors, but you know, <laughs> but we're good at we're good at making it seem, seem plausible. And when you put somebody in that space, um, it opens up their imagination to all sorts of things um, beyond that. So they keep they build out the world themselves that, that the science fiction writer sort of pretends to uh, suggest, um, and especially people who have um, scientific scientist proclivities will build it out in ways the the writer never imagined. Uh, and create a perhaps a future that really it will be. Yeah. Okay. Paul, you want to feel that? Yeah, let me say one thing on that. I, I write primarily nonfiction. Um, what really works for me is that I get a lot of feedback on my website. Um, often I'll hear from kids and they'll tell me that what they're reading, that they'll say, I don't really understand this, but I want to do this. What, should, what do I need? What, and, and, and so I'll recommend books to them and so on. But that engagement with the younger generation is extremely significant to me. Science fiction does that because kids get hooked on science fiction. Uh, but they're also getting hooked on science fact. And every time I connect with one of them, uh, I feel like, yes, you know, this is really good. I did something today with that article. I reached at least one, uh, one young student who might make it a career out of this. Or maybe not, but at least it influenced his thinking, and that gets around. Uh, you know, you build these things one at a time, and I always think in terms of what we're building for the future generations, and it just gives me a real kick to see how ideas get propagated from one generation to the next, and what we can do to excite generations ahead of us uh, with these topics. Sarah, can, can you tell us a little bit of, I, I know you were furiously taking notes, so what, what are some of the ideas that, that you got from this conference that excite you? First thing, it's on. Okay, okay. it's on. Um, which probably means I shouldn't be writing anything having to do with science, considering that I do it non-technology. Um, I, got, I got a lot of ideas, but more importantly, and, and if I can sort of distill what I think both Tony and, and, and Paul were saying. What I got was a sense of the immensity, that in, uh, uh, the immensity of the project of interstellar flight. It's something that will, by necessity, have to consume, even, even if by in the sky we get away to get there really fast, just preparing to go there, it's going to consume generations. This is, in, in, in a certain way, we're like little kids dreaming of what we're going to do when we grow up. <laughs> and I know my kid, when he was very young, dreamed of eventually, as he put it, throwing stuff at Mars. And, <laughs> and this has propelled him. He was an indifferent student because most of the stuff in school bored him. But it has propelled him is getting a dual engineering degree in electrical engineering and mechanical. And it's a big endeavor. And he's being propelled by those dreams he had when he was young. In the same way, if we're going to get to the stars, the, the entire species needs to be inspired, or as many of them as read, to dream of it. And we're the people who, who create the dreams of the species that, that hopefully will propel a generational endeavor to reach for the stars. Hopefully. <laughs> if I can expand on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I was going to say also it's for the kids, um, specifically mine, 
uh, but also in general, uh, all of the kids. It's not often that you run across an eight-year-old um, who, when uh, viewing a piece of art in the museum, is suddenly inspired to, to, uh, to become a world-famous artist. Um, but you see a lot of people who read science fiction and then are inspired to go into the sciences. And I think that's very important for them. Uh, so why science fiction? It's because it's, from what I've seen, the most inspirational of the genres for, uh, for bringing people into, into feeling that they have a calling for something in their life, not just you know, for the next year or two. I have one, one thing to add. You know, but my day job, I'm a scientist. Is this it's it's on. On. Okay, at my day job, I'm a scientist. I have to warn the participants here what I got from the workshop. Though the names will be changed, a lot of you are going to be characters in my next book. <laughs> That's true, not everyone will survive. I know that. <laughs> Appreciate that, Joe. Thank you. Well, I've been redshirted by the best of you. I had uh, at one point um, Kevin Anderson and uh, his wife are friends, and his wife uh, Rebecca Mesta was writing a book, and she was late, and Kevin had to go out of town, and he told me, "I need you to make sure she finishes this book this week." And when the book came out, um, about three months later or so, uh, it was. Do that quickly, yes. Uh, um, I found uh, some people as they were starting to read it said, How come Rebecca killed you? Uh, and, uh, I don't know. I'll ask her. I called her up and she said, Did I kill you? I don't remember doing that. <laughs> Apparently, I was such a pest that she killed me without even thinking about it. You were, you were an effective editor. You were doing your job. <laughs> you died in the line of duty. Uh, we, we should perhaps have put a warning in the uh, in the meeting material that uh, associating with authors is a dangerous uh, proposition <laughs> and can get you killed in, in fiction. Um, T Tony brought up uh, a point, which is which is that all of all what we do is entertainment. Um, I, I, I'm a great watcher of uh, Turner Classic Movies, and there's an interview on with uh, Frank Capra this month. And he says something to the effect of, you can't sell the American people anything if you don't entertain them. Um, and, and one of the, we, yes, we do want to sell the American people um, on the idea of a hopeful future. Um, one, of the, the, one of the points that somebody had made to me was that so much science fiction these days uh, is dystopian. Um, we're looking at a future that is not hopeful. Um, and I, I think that there's absolutely a, a point to that, that there's a reason for that to be, but it's not the only way to look at the future. And it's important that somebody uh, look at the future in a way that's hopeful. Um, the question again is, why do we think leaving the planet is a hopeful thing? Uh, for me, one of the things that we talked about in, uh, in, in my little group was uh, the idea that we have to, that uh, our evolution leads us to be <coughs> curious, uh, to, to look what is beyond that next hill, that we are compelled uh, to go out, to see new things, to have new experiences, and to find out more about our neighborhood, whether that neighborhood is the mountain, the ridge, the beach, the ocean, the next island, what have you. Um, but not everybody feels that. Can you, s so for our dream, our dream of getting off the planet, the truth that we hold self-evident that this is a good and useful thing to do, a necessary thing to do, requires other people to help us get there. It goes down, I, I'm a businesswoman. I, I, I care about the bottom line. I, I don't work for a, for a government agency where money is just magically appears. I have to make... No, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I resemble that. I mean, I resemble that. <laughs> so the question is, is, is who's going to pay for this and why should they pay for it? Um, and that's part of what I think we need to be figuring out. Who pays for it and why should they? Um, Paul, do you have any, have any answers for? Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, 
among the answers, and I'll just give one because we've got a whole panel to give answers here, but uh, there are very practical reasons for going to space that go beyond the fact that we're sort of hardwired to want to go beyond our curiosity. Uh, for one thing, uh, as has been said before, the dinosaurs have no space program. Uh, we know they were put out of commission by some enormous impact, most likely, uh, many millions of years ago. Um, the solar system is a dangerous place. It's filled with uh, objects that are moving around in nearby space. Uh, any one of these of sufficient size could be highly destructive to our civilization. Conceivably, a large enough one could put an end to it. Uh, we're trying to catalog these, but uh, one reason that uh, you want to move into space uh, as a matter of survival is the fact that we do need to find out where these objects are, and should we find something that is on a dangerous orbit, especially if it's out a long way away uh, in the outer solar system headed for us, we need to find out how to move it, how to put a human crew out there to evaluate it, how to decide what uh, can be done to change its trajectory. Now, that is going to, of necessity, create a, an infrastructure within space throughout the solar system for nothing more than self-defense. Now, I would argue that once that infrastructure has been built for self-defensive purposes, it invariably uh, melds with the commercial infrastructure that will sustain it and support it and help it grow. And once you have created those technologies, you've created a situation where you're looking at the possibility of going ever further out. So uh, for my one uh, entry there, I would say survival is a very key motivator along with curiosity. And I'll turn it back over to Tony. Continue with this. Yep. Well, um, my own personal impetus is, um, is that I think human beings are, are the most amazing thing that creation has produced. There's nothing like us that, uh, that we know of. And um, we are able to use language. We are able to do. Um, a human being painted the Mona Lisa. A human being wrote Hamlet. A human being figured out space time, the structure of space time. And we need to uh, we need to survive, and we need to go out. And we need to. The more of us there are, the better. From in my opinion, um, I'm not somebody that thinks that uh, that humanity is some kind of cancer on the on the world. I think it's exactly the opposite. Um, that the universe is very lucky to have us um, <laughs> and that we may even find a way to to save the universe in the end from uh, from, from the, whatever end it has in mind for itself uh, or create some meaning for uh, why it, things are uh, so I think humans need to get out there I think there need to be more and more of us because the more of us there are the more chances there are for another guy that can write Hamlet another guy that can uh, can take Einstein further, et cetera. Okay. Well, I guess I, I want to add to this because I think we need to go to save the planet. I, I think uh, planet Earth is a beautiful place. It's the only place we know of that harbors life, right? And, and the solar system is full of resources that we can use to help sustain our civilization so we don't foul the nest. And it, it to me, for the reasons that were said here, I agree with 100%, but I also, in, in looking at this vast, empty, appearing universe around us, at least nearby, it's almost a moral imperative. You know, if, if we're the only life that's here and there's a whole universe, I mean, why are we sitting around wasting our time? We need to get out there and start exploring and spreading life, which is good. So uh, I view it as a, as a moral question. And, and I, I think the moral answer is we improve life on Earth using space technology, and as we go, we take people wherever we can go. There's also the way we're made. Uh, my friend Dave Freer, who also writes for Bain, is a biologist, and he talks to me a lot about the way various species work. Whatever we are, we are built on an ape frame. Social apes have a particular structure, which, you know, they've grew up in Africa and apparently spent a lot of time watching. <laughs> and uh, he says ape bands have outliers. The outliers are the ones who don't quite fit in. 
They're also the ones who tend to go off, especially young males, and get new territory and adapt to different ways of doing things, which both keeps the species supple because otherwise these young males would get killed because they don't fit in. They, it keeps them supple, it keeps them diversified, it gives them a better chance at survival of the species as a whole, and it keeps the species itself healthier. Well, that's what we are, and if we're confined to the territory here, the territory we know, we're going to start eating ourselves, not hopefully literally, <laughs> and stagnate which is where all the dystopic futures are coming from because people have lost hope of going elsewhere. And there's a tendency to pan down the nail that sticks up, which <laughs> creates a very conformist and not very adaptable society. So for the sake of those who will go and those who will stay, we need to go. We need to have a place for our outliers which I suspect is the majority of people here anyway. But I am. And we mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> I am. Yes, it's all. No, no actually, it's not all. It keeps turning itself off. We have it all changed. Okay, it's fine. Um, wow, those are all great answers. I don't know what else to say to that other than I just there's some kind of an appeal to being the cantankerous old man that says, hey, you kids, get off my asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we've, we've answered some of the why. Um, I, I think there's a lot more why to be, to, to be gotten to. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that we wanted to do with this workshop and why we gathered these people here was not only to stimulate our own imaginations, um, not only to share the expertise on how to build solar sails and how to, how to build uh, fusion bomb spaceships, but how to, uh, how, but, but to inspire us to also find out how we can go out and, and talk to the rest of our friends, our communities, our people about these things that are so very, very important. Um, and, and I hope that, 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 that our science fiction writers will, will, will be part of that, but I also hope our, our, our tech guys will be part of that too. Um, and uh, when a science fiction writer calls you up out of the blue and says, hey, can you take a look at my spaceship? Will this work? You guys will help out. Um, ah, okay. And, um, Oh, and Andy is volunteering. <laughs> you look at my writer's spaceships and you tell them if they'll work out. <laughs> yeah. I have some questions from the audience. Yeah, all right. I, so, so I think at this point, um, let's uh, let, let's field some questions for the audience. Can can we can we play stump stump the writer? That's always fun. Uh, <laughs> and it, yeah, questions. Too easy to stump the writer. All right, well, I'll, I'll ask, uh, how many people out there have, have read Robert Heinlein? Yeah, okay. Um, how many people have read Lois Bujold? All right, well, the people who have read Heinlein and haven't yet read Bujold need to go read Bujold right now. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it would, yes, question. We're giving. I'm Lorraine Glenn. Everybody calls me Rain, and I am the space track director at DragonCon. If any of you have ever heard of DragonCon, um, what's that? <laughs> Tony, I understand that you not just publish all of this wonderful science fiction, but that you have another little part of the company that sort of promotes education along these lines? Well, especially with like one of your authors who happens to be like sitting up there and has a book for sale? Yeah, I think it's him. Actually, all of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm, I'm a businesswoman. So, so everything that I do goes to bottom line. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, I publish on our website, I publish nonfiction, um, and my brief for the nonfiction is things that I think will be of interest to science fiction write readers, which is a very broad <laughs> uh, range of things. And a lot of what, of what that is uh, are, are nonfiction, um, and, and we are certainly hoping to get a lot of publications um, for the website out of that. Um, but the reason I publish it is because I think people are interested in it, and I think it will draw people to my website, and I think it will lead people to go to the free sample uh, section of, of our website and take a look at the first few chapters of a book by Sarah Hoyt or Les Johnson or Tony Daniel, and then they're going to pay me money. So. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, well, that's, that's, thank you. Thank you for being more specific. Teacher uh, guides. The teacher guides. Yeah, that, 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 that's another thing that, that, that we do that is, that, that is coldly uh, um, exploitive, is that we give out free, uh, free, free guides, teacher's guides, to, uh, to some of our books, including the, the books that are based on, on hard science um, and including Going Interstellar. Um, these are available for, uh, for download, they're available for teachers or librarians or parents who are interested in um, engaging uh, their intelligent kids uh, about science fiction and about where the differences between fiction and, and science lie. Um, and uh, They're one, written by usually teachers. They're written by teachers um, and uh, one of the things that we hope to do is create new readers. You know, we, we, we want to grow them um, so, so that I can retire on a nice, fat, uh, steady flow of income from the new people who are reading our books. So. They, they really are wonderful for teachers. It's, it's a fabulous, I give them away at Dragon Con. So quite a Absolutely, well. yeah. Yeah, yeah it is one of the many things that we do to, to bring people um, into, uh, into Bain and, and to see what it is that we do. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah. Good. What do you come across that really? You probably hear me. No. Let's let's use the mic just okay. to be safe. Okay. What do you come across that's most effective? I mentioned this is for kids. Let's take that. What have you come across that's most effective in making kids think? Is it book clubs? Is it first-person things where they read, they, they get immersed in it, they think about it? The different kids are different, but yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that we haven't really explored explored book and idea clubs. There must be a certain size school at which that becomes practical based on the number of imaginative kids. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience in this? Do you discuss it? Well, yeah, you, you can't advertise for that in the papers. They just come and get you. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think kids are, are, are really not very different from uh, from certainly us. Uh, that talking about the ideas uh, and, and bouncing ideas off of each other um, and other interested parties is uh, has got to be part of the process. Um, the internet in some ways has been good for that, in some ways been bad. Um, it, it's, it's harder to reach people um, without uh, having defenses up these days. Um, so uh, I, I think that's more of a, uh, how, how do we do this? We don't have an answer for it yet. Um, but we will have another Tennessee Valley Interstellar workshop, um, and I think we should put that question uh, to that workshop. Uh, Johan, did, did you uh, want yeah, to? I'll lift the mic. Okay, so I'm thinking back what uh, they were saying, and basically it's uh, Harry Potter. That book was tremendous part of world kids. Mm -hmm. Even my nephew read it when he was six. Okay, how can we have a kids science fiction on the same caliber as Harry Potter? If if I knew that, then I would probably be on my private island somewhere. It is. It's an idea. It is, and I, I think one, I think one of the, one of the reasons why Harry Potter was was so very successful, other than just you know the magic of uh, any best selling author, is that uh, Harry Potter and his friends solved problems. Um, it was one problem solving uh, thing after another in that book, um, and I think that's got to be part of. Uh, what we do because humans like solving problems. It's fun for us. 
Um, so you know that that's my advice to the you know the next would be science fiction uh, bestseller is, is is include that in what in, in what it is that you do. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, thank thank you all for for coming and for listening to us. We really appreciate it. And uh, as my friend David Drake says, go do good things. <laughs>and I know you, you will talk about it. So uh, be available to chat. We'll hang around as long as people are interested. Thanks for coming out.